for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us. We're thankful for Brian and Jaji and uh, them coming to uh, preach uh, the gospel to us and thankful for the good work that uh, they both do at the Florida School of Preaching and at the uh, congregation there. We pray, Father, that we will have uh, open hearts and open ears to what he has to say to us this morning. We pray that all done and said in this assembly will be in accordance with thy word, and that it will bring honor and glory to thy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's great to be with you this morning. We look forward to the week uh, in preaching the gospel and appreciate the elders here, appreciate Paul and Heather and the work that they do, and I just appreciate being here. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in just a moment. We're going to have a lesson from there, but I'm going to mention the Florida School of Preaching here. I'm going to use the Florida School of Preaching to illustrate the sermon uh, here and uh, the Florida School of Preaching. Well, let me just get this first slide here before we get to the text. Uh, we are located in Lakeland, Florida, and uh, we've been at that same address since 1969. And uh, there's a pretty cool history on how we came about and why we came about, but I have to save that for another time. Just the basics here we were founded by BC Carr and the South Florida Avenue Church of Christ in 1969. And uh, B.C. Good Pastor and G.K. Wallace were a great encouragement to that. And uh, there's a good, great history about that. But I want to say that for another time. And these are just some of the, the highlights as I see it from the school. We were approved for the G.I. Bill in 1972. And, 19, and so that changed a lot of things with government regulations and all of that. And that's the time we became a day school like we are now. We have three classes a, or two classes a day, two three-hour classes a day. Monday through Friday, and so that's like 30 credits, uh, college level. And when I went to Freed Hardeman, after I graduated the School of Preaching, we had to have special permission to take more than 16, I think it was. Uh, but these guys and all those who go through the school are well-educated, well-versed. Uh, our lectureship began in 1976, and so the one coming up in 25 is our 50th anniversary of the lectureship. And we had a fully furnished computer lab in 1996. Uh, which was significant. I think we're the first school of preaching to have that. I mean, that, uh, we had a computer lab before with hand me downs, but you know, this is a full fledged one. And we were remodeled, whoops, to go back up to the code. Whoop, I think, oh, there you go. Uh, oh, gotta learn this one. All right, anyway, uh, remodeled in 2019 a student house uh, that, that we have for the students to live in. And so that's a good feature. Then all this time we have continued to prepare men to preach. All right, now here's where 2 Timothy 3 comes in. Why do we exist? Now, there's all kinds of passages in the Bible that we could turn to to show this, but the one I've chosen for this lesson is because of the Word of God, because the Word of God. And if you look at your, your Bibles here, and I'm going to read uh, 14, chapter 3, 14, through chapter 4, verse 2, and then we'll break that down into three main points. And really, the, the title of this lesson is The Importance of the Word of God, The Importance of the Word of God. In verse 14, but you must continue, Paul writes Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from, a chi from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry through verse 5. Now, three reasons why we exist and three reasons why the Word of God is important. 
And we're going to look at all three of these in separate points, but here's where I'm going with this lesson. The Word of God must be learned, the Word of God must be taught, and the Word of God must be continued. And so that's the importance of the Word of God, but that's also why we exist as a Florida School of Preaching. Now let's look at the importance, uh, or the Word of God must be learned. In verse 14, you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, <clears throat> knowing of whom you have learned them. Now, where did Timothy learn the scripture? His yes, his mother and his grandmother, first of all, and then the apostle Paul. Uh, and this is a very good point. Turn to Acts chapter 16. Well, keep, keep your ribbon marker or your finger or a pencil or something in there, an attendance card maybe, uh, in 2 Timothy. But go back to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. You know, what kind of home uh, did, was Timothy brought up in? What kind of home in verse chapter Acts 16? <clears throat> he, I like to say he was from a religiously mixed uh, home. Uh, in Acts 16, verse 1, then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there <clears throat> named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And so he learned first in the home. Where do preachers come from? First and foremost, Christian's home, Christian homes. And I was talking to a director. I met him at a lectureship in Texas, and he was the second director of the Sunset School of Preaching. And I don't know that I agree with everything from there, but he and I, I never met him before. I didn't know who he was. We just had a cup of coffee, met, and I introduced myself. He introduced himself. <clears throat> and he asked, uh, how, 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 how is recruiting coming? You know, I said, man, it's very difficult these days to try to find men who want to preach. And he said, yeah, we had the same problem when I was a director. And uh, he said, he thinks, and he was much older than me <clears throat> and wiser, I suppose, in that area. But he said the main reason he thought was is because Christian homes are not encouraging their young men to preach. And uh, he said the key to turning this around is getting Christian homes to instill in their sons the idea of preaching and instill in their daughters the idea of marrying preachers and becoming elders' wives and so forth, and even with the sons, become elders. And uh, I thought, that's, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, because preachers, they don't just drop from the sky. Uh, they are encouraged. They are trained. Uh, and that, that word of encouragement in the beginning puts it in there. And, uh, in fact, I think I was talking, I don't know if it was Paul or not, Mama's teacher. You know, mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Was that you I was talking about that? Okay. Somebody else with a nice deep voice like him. But uh, he's got a sermon on that, but oh, he applies it to preachers. You know, mamas don't let your kids because it seems like, you know, be doctors, be lawyers, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I know part of that in the past has been because the way congregations treat preachers sometimes. Uh, I think all that's improving, and I think you guys treat preachers pretty well and their families just from what I know here. But that's not always the case. And so it kind of drives people, parents away from uh, their kids being preachers and, and, and kids away and all that kind of stuff. But the Christian home, that's the first place where preachers are going to come. But if you're like me, I never even heard of the Church of Christ until I was 18 years old. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. Uh, where else are preachers going to come from? The local church. Notice it was the local churches from Lystra and Iconium that introduced Timothy to Paul. Hey, Paul, here's a guy you need to meet. He might be a good co-worker. And we know the rest of the story. You know, Timothy was one of Paul's most trusted and valuable co-workers out of all the ones that he had. But the Word of God must be learned, but it starts in the home. But if the home is not there to do that, then there's the local church. And so that's where preachers come from. But that's not even part of the main points here, all right? But three reasons why the Word of God must be learned. Number one, it must be learned because it makes us wise to salvation. Again, notice in uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation uh, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, does knowledge of the Scriptures alone save us? No, knowledge alone doesn't save us. 
A lot of people know a lot of scripture. Denominational people know a lot of scripture. Even atheists know a lot of scripture, at least back in the day. Um, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, he wasn't an atheist, but Ingersoll Rand was, and he knew a lot of scriptures. Uh, yeah, same guy with the diesel engines and all that, but anyway. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, in his, some of his speeches, he would quote scripture, like a house divided against itself cannot stand, but he wouldn't tell you what book, chapter, and verse that came from, <clears throat> because most people in that day and age knew where that was. You know, the Bible was a textbook in... <clears throat> in public schools, like in the 1800s and so forth, even early 1900s, uh, we had prayer a lot of times in schools, along with the Pledge of Allegiance, all that. Uh, that stuff is not around much anymore. Uh, but there are a lot of people that know Scripture. But Scripture by itself doesn't save us. Notice here he says, which is able, uh, you have known the Holy Scriptures, makes you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the through faith part is what connects Scripture with salvation. When we through faith apply what the Scriptures teach, then we have salvation. And so Scriptures are absolutely necessary for salvation. Cannot have salvation without it. Now we do know that it's the blood of Christ that washes us from our sins, Revelation 1.5. But how do we even know about Christ? How do we even know about sin? How do we even know about what we must do to be saved, repentance, confession, baptism? It's only through the scriptures that we know that. And so the scriptures are absolutely necessary for salvation, but they alone don't save. It's through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, also, scriptures are God-breathed, or the word of God is God-breathed. And, uh, and I'm sure Paul has preached this, and you've heard it before from all the preachers from this pulpit. Uh, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The six words right there in our English translation, and I'm reading from the New King James translation, those six words come from just one Greek word that means God breathed. Uh, God breathed. Uh, theos is God, and then uh, pneumos is spirit, but it also means breath. It also means wind. Same word we get pneumatic from, like a pneumatic wrench. Uh, those pneumo, pneumonia, all those words come from that pneumos. And when you put those together in this word here, it's God breathed. And I believe the ESV probably has the best translation on that. All scripture is breathed out by God. What we have here is not just ink and paper, but this is the very mind of God revealed to us. It is God breathed. And because of that, it must be learned. And then also in verses 16 and 17, it fully equips us for every good work. And we've often, you've heard this, and I'm not saying anything new here, but, you know, the Scripture thoroughly furnishes us, equips us for every good work. For all, all we need is, is right here, the Scripture. Now, we have commentaries. We have Sunday morning Bible, you know, lesson books and all that kind of thing, and those are all good. But if they don't harmonize, if they don't help us to understand this, then they are of no, good, no value. In fact, they are of not just no value, but they are actually a detriment to our learning, to our understanding of Scripture. And so it all must harmonize with God's Word, and only in that way can it fully equip us. All right? And so the school of preaching, is that's what we're all about, is learning the Word of God. And we began in 1969... This is a second year class. Uh, the brother standing there on the back row, the far left right there, not doctrinally, of course, but uh, positionally, all right. Uh, that's Maurice Davis. He, became, he later became a teacher at the School of Preaching. And uh, he had this quote, this famous quote. Uh, he said, mamas make preachers. Mamas make preachers. In other words, what he meant by that is mothers are the ones that encourage. It's their encouragement that really pays off for a son to become a preacher. Uh, he died about 2013 or so, but anyway, the guy next to him, William Carrison, he's still preaching. Well, actually, he just stepped down from full-time preaching in Plant City, Florida, and uh, this picture is also good because it shows we were never, we were never segregated. Uh, of course, 1969 was when that uh, integration stuff started happening, and there's a good story behind all that as to why 
We don't want to be a white school. We don't want to be a black school. And that's, that's way back in the beginning, before the school even started. Uh, men were talking about that and congregations and all that. But uh, we, we began, and that upstairs, yeah, that's the upstairs of our building. And that was built in 1968 to accommodate the school. And uh, where the school meets right now was built in 1980 to accommodate the school. It's attached to the same building on the same property. And uh, we were going to be building another building here. Uh, or actually, we're going to, yeah, we were, the church was going to build another building to help out the school. Uh, but we discovered some underground plumbing problems that set all that back. Money-wise and time-wise, we have to fix that first. And we're in the process of doing that now. Uh, here's a, another picture I like to show. BC Cars right there in the middle. You see that woman right there in the middle? Uh, this is from the 70s. She was a, an English teacher. She was an English grammar teacher. And she was, uh, you know, iron fist, uh, you know, hammer down, taught grammar. Uh, also, BC Cars right next to her, just to the right of hers, we're looking at this picture. He's the one in the tie. And I like to show this picture for two reasons. Number one, we do respect and honor the role of women in the church. Uh, they are not to usurp or have authority over men when it comes to teaching the Bible and things like that, but they are useful. And so she taught English grammar, didn't mention much Bible, but taught the grammar, and that was good. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, we don't require our students to wear ties every day. Now, some preaching schools do. We don't. Uh, instructors do. They do have to wear a coat and tie when they speak in chapel. That's a must. Uh, but we don't have them uh, wear a tie. And, um, you know, that... That's not a new rule that goes way back. And we've had students that came that because that was one of the main factors that uh, caused them to come here. We are the Florida number one factor, school of preaching, and our dress code, uh, they, they dress like that. Of course, we have, you know, collared shirts today and all that. All right, and then um, this is the current students on the right. And we have five full-time, actually have six full-time guys. One is in Louisiana and he comes in online. We have a lot of part-time guys, but these are the guys that have taken two years out of their lives uh, to train. Uh, the guy front row middle, he's married and has children. And the back row right, he is married, has children. He came from France, believe it or not, Paris, France. Sold everything he had to get the money to come here. And so he is here. And the other three are not married. And so I, I, I mentioned their marital status and children just to let you know that it's very difficult for guys who are married with children to come to school to raise the necessary support to help them. We do not charge tuition, but the guys do have to have living expenses. Those, actually the four guys, one in the middle with a wife and children, he stays in the student housing Monday night through Thursday night, and then he, he'll come Monday morning to take classes. He'll leave after Friday's classes and go home on the weekend. He lives about an hour and a half away in Bradenton, Florida, and so that's his, his situation. Uh, and then Dreyfus uh, from, from France, uh, he lives in a uh, Orange Street Church of Christ is about 30 minutes away and they have a preacher's house that they're not using and they, so they let students live in the preacher's house. And then on the right there, or the picture on the left is Jaji and I right there and then <clears throat> actually Jaji and me and then Brian Howard is our um, uh, fundraiser recruiter guy, director of development and Kathy, Kathy right there in the middle next to Jaji. If you were to call the office Monday through Thursday, she's one that will likely answer the phone. Kathy and I are the only full-time employees at the Florida School of Preaching. Uh, the rest of those are part-time, and then our, most of our instructors are, teacher, are preachers who preach full-time, and then they come and teach a class, one or two classes a week. And so that's, uh, that's, but the Word of God must be learned, and that's our learning right there. All right, <clears throat> secondly, well actually, any questions or comments on the Word of God must be learned. The Word of God must be learned. All right. Uh, secondly, the Word of God must be taught. Since it must be learned, <clears throat> it must be taught. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. And here are some reasons why the Word of God must be taught. Number one, there's an urgency to get the word of God out. Now this was instilled in me a long time ago when I first came to work with the school in 1996. That's a long time, that's last century, all right? Uh, but man, it's been, been great. Yeah, you know, time flies when you're having fun is the old expression. And I'm telling you, I'm having all kinds of fun, let me tell you. <laughs> Even though there's all kinds of bumps in the road and obstacles and all that, but man, it's fun. 
All right, but anyway, um, in, in um, the urgency of the Word of God. But yeah, I was filling and preaching at a place, and so we would go home to his house on, uh, you know, between services, and then, you know, kick off your shoes, relax at his house, and come back for evening services. And this guy, he was, he was, uh, he was on the ground level of the Apollo projects, you know, the Apollo rockets back in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And so he, and he was old at that time. He's deceased now, but he lived to be over 100. Uh, but he lived in this, you know, he, he bought, probably bought that house in the 60s or 70s, and it was an upscale neighborhood back then. You know, he was an engineer and all that. Uh, now it's probably upper middle class and stuff, but a huge neighborhood, huge neighborhood. I mean, there's over 1,000 houses in the subdivision, he said, and he lived way in the back. And so we would drive through there, and these houses were like, you know, probably 30 feet between them, just nice houses, but just that close to one another. And he says, you know, see, behind every door as we're driving through there, behind every door there's at least one or two, sometimes three or four lost souls. And he says, you know, behind these, how many, how many of these are ready, do you think, if God were to come in judgment right now? And I know we're not as densely populated here in New Philadelphia as they are, but how many doors that we pass by every day are ready for God to come, Jesus to come in judgment? I say that percentage is very, very low. And so there's an urgency to get the message out. Uh, notice he says, I charge you, and that's a solemn, you know, a solemn uh, imperative there uh, to uh, preach the word of God before the living and or who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And we don't know when that will be, but we need to be ready for it so that when it comes, we're not caught by surprise. I worked at a lumber yard. If you're familiar with Florida and your old timer, Scotty's Lumber, you know, it started there in Florida. Uh, they're out of business now. That's a good story, too, to talk about. Started by members of the church, too, which is another good story to talk about, but I don't have time now. But uh, I worked with some World War II veterans back then, back in the day, and they had this expression. They would tell me what this guy told me. that we, I, I learned this in Europe on the European front, you know. Stay ready to keep from having to get ready. Stay ready to keep from having to get ready. And there's a good spiritual application in that too. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but stay ready so you don't have to get, worry about getting ready. And that's, that's the parable of the foolish virgins and the parable of the talents there in Matthew chapter 25. Be ready. You don't know when the bridegroom's coming. There might not be time to get the oil. There won't be, actually. Uh, be ready. You don't know when the master of the house is coming back and he wants to know what you did with the talents he gave you. We don't know when Jesus is coming. And so stay ready to keep from having to get ready. But there's a lot of people behind those doors we drive by that are not ready. And so we have to get the message out. Now, in this, uh, he says, be ready, or be instant, the old King James says, in season, out of season. Now, how many in here actually heard in person Marshall Keeble? Marshall Keeble. Yeah, not no one here has raised their hand, and so that's, you know, and that number is getting less and less because he lived so long ago. And I was in Okeechobee preaching one time, and I asked that same question, and a bunch of people raised up their hand, about seven of them. And that congregation was only, well, there were about 80 people there that day, but there was a snowbird place. A lot of people come down and, and stay down there. Um, but he always used to say about this, preach to them when they're ready or when they're not, and when they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Actually, that's it, when they want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Now, I don't know if we could actually document uh, everything that they said, Marshall Keeble said, so I don't even know if he actually said that, but... You know, that's what people say, and I've heard that all my life. But it's true, nonetheless, uh, because the words here, be instant in season, out of season. Uh, both in season and out of season come from the same root word that means time. One has a prefix that means good, E-U, like euphoria, but good in good times. And the other prefix has a, has a prefix, or the other word has a prefix that means bad or evil. And so whether it's good times or evil times, Bad times, great times, whatever, preach the word. And uh, there's, al there's always an application. God's word can always give us an application. Uh, there's never a wrong time to teach the word of God. Now, may God give us wisdom to teach the most beneficial thing at the most opportune time. We do need wisdom in that area. But there's never a bad time to teach what God has to say about something. 
But again, we do need discretion and wisdom when we, when we do introduce that. But the Word of God will apply to any situation. There's something in the Word of God that can apply to any situation, that can help people through bad times, through good times, and that can be preached where, whether you know, people want to hear it or don't want to hear it. It, it. it is the Word of God. It is the seed, the Word of God, and it will benefit always. Now, in this verse, he tells us what to preach, the Word, not denominationalism, not human philosophy, not, you know, agendas, uh, political agendas, but the Word of God. Not a new hermeneutic, not a new world translation, but the Word of God. And he has several synonyms for the Word of God in our text. He mentioned Holy Scriptures up in chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, he mentioned Scripture in verse 16. Uh, he mentions the truth. Uh, he mentions doctrine. He mentions uh, other things throughout this context. All those are referring to the Word of God. And so what is the Word of God? When are we to do it? In season, out of season? Uh, and which basically says anytime, all the time. Kind of like pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Uh, but with the Word of God, there's always a time to teach and to, to live the Word of God. Why are we to do that? Notice she says there, uh, to convince, rebuke, and exhort. That word convince or convict, some translations might have there. It means to expose sin. It means to expose something. It's the same Greek word when Jesus said, which of you, in John 8, which of you convicteth me of sin? You know, how, which of you can expose my sin, show my sin? And, of course, nobody could because he didn't have sin. But that's the word there. Rebuke means to correct. Uh, sometimes it can be strong. Sometimes it can be mild. Uh, and then exhort means to encourage. So to convince, to rebuke, and to exhort or to reprove, uh, rebuke, exhort. Uh, that is what, why we are to preach and teach the Word of God. And what must accompany it or how with long-suffering and doctrine or teaching. And those of us who are parents know this. Those of us uh, maybe who are elders in the church, we know this. People don't always respond how they should when they're taught. And so that's true of members of the church. And so and that's true of people behind those doors. But we must continue to teach and preach with long-suffering. Long-suffering. And uh, God is our perfect example, and that word can be broken down. Macro, thumia, is that word. Macro means great or long. It's the opposite of micro. You know, micro is small, macro. And then the other word means anger, uh, emotion type of thing. And so what that word is saying is it takes a long time for God to get angry, for God to, and we see that in the prophets, you know, it takes a long time. You know, how long-suffering was God? He's long-suffering with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, Second uh, Peter 3, verse 9. And so we are to teach, when we teach and preach, we are to have patience, long-suffering, realizing that people are not going to change right away. Uh, you think about the church in Corinth, you know, the, the, the baggage that they had in their pagan life, and they're baptized. And when we're baptized, that doesn't mean all that, all those ideas, all those thoughts and all that are now washed away too. We have to continually work on those. But we are forgiven of our sins. We have a clean, a clean slate, and we must repent. And, of course, when we do sin, repent and pray God's forgiveness. But uh, we're not going to be perfect. And so we have to have long-suffering with those we teach, but also doctrine. And I think that's so important. You know, Christianity is a taught religion. And no two ways about it. That's one of the differences between the Old Covenant. Remember Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, for they shall all be taught of God. No more. In John 6, 44, Jesus repeats that. No more shall we, you know, uh, teach, uh, let's see. Well, in the Old Law, remember the Old Law, they were circumcised the eighth day. The men were, then they were taught as they grew. But in the, in the New Law, we have to be taught before we enter into that covenant. And so that's the point there. But with the doctrine. We need to, and I know sometimes that, that term indoctrination is often used in a negative way, and there is a negative sense in it, but we have to know the Scriptures. We have to know what thus says the Lord. 
We have to know the difference between things that, are, that God obligates us to do and things that are optional, you know, expedience. We need to know salvation. We need to know about Jesus. And all this stuff is, is encapsulated in the, in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Remember, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. Um, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe, notice it says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. A person cannot know everything before he or she is baptized, but he must know to observe what he does learn later. Go ahead, my brother. Question? Just like we're told in Romans chapter 10 about the church there, the people, um, the people of Israel had a zeal for God, but not yes, for his knowledge. Exactly. And therefore, without the knowledge, they instituted their own right to, mm -hmm. to separate themselves even further. Right. But again, right. this is on the doctrine. You have to have zeal, you mm -hmm. have to have the willingness. Yep. But without the knowledge, it's, it's useful. Yep, that's absolutely correct. Uh, the reference there to Romans, and uh, that would illustrate the point I made earlier, too, about, about the Word of God. Knowing the scriptures is important, but it's applying them through faith. And, uh, and of course, there in Romans 10, as our brother mentioned here, they had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And, they, and it was more than just what they did, what that zeal did was more than just, you know, negate the word of God, but it actually was actively opposed to it. It's one thing just to, yeah, that's the word of God, whatever, just go about my life. But it's another thing to to involve a system of righteousness that opposes God's system and to go with that. And so, you know, that's, that's a good observation right there. But doctrine, you have to have both zeal and knowledge. And, um, and that's a very good point. All right, but long-suffering and doctrine. And so the Word of God must be taught. Now, the Fuller School of Preaching, yeah, there's a bunch of slides right there. Uh, start with the bottom right there that's what the classroom looked like uh, well when i when i went to school we had it arranged the other way uh, there's a short wall and a long wall that's a rectangular one but when we introduced all the technology and stuff it'd be better we thought to have it the other way so we switched it around so we're on the long wall now instead of the short wall and then the upper left is what the classroom looks like now uh, we painted the walls and updated. We're constantly updating the classroom to, to inc incorporate the technology and the learning environment. Uh, we had some plans for this before we discovered the plumbing problem, and so those plans were put off, but this is a pretty good arrangement right here. Uh, and then we have on the lower left there, we have student days where local, local churches of Christ will invite us to come and conduct their services. And so in this particular picture here, the... Uh, oh yeah, we got yeah, I got the screen here. So we have the the guy in the far the first the first row far right. He's a student. The guy next to him with the coat and bow tie. He was the local song leader. He's a school teacher. And then the guy next to him is the local preacher, Gilbert Miller. He's been down there for a long time. And then right next to him is uh, one of our students, uh, C.J. Grimes. And then next to him is another student. And the guy whose face with the beard is barely in. He's another student. Uh, the, two, the three guys on top, of course, you have me in the middle there is another student. This was a year or two ago. And then the other brother is one of the local brothers there. But these student days are good because it helps our students, you know, get some real, real-time experience preaching in front of people they don't know. Also, they get a good cultural awakening. Uh, sometimes the congregations like this, they'll serve us, you know, uh, pig feet and chitlins, you know, okay. And uh, that's all right. Uh, along with the fried chicken and stuff, preach the word, eat the bird, you know. And so uh, they have a good good time with these student days. In fact, you'll ask these, these students like 10, 20 years after they graduated, you know, what are some of the things you remember most? And that's these student days right here. And uh, they'll take us in and all that. Uh, we do have uh, opportunities to go to foreign mission trips. Uh, we're going to do this now, uh, I think, every year. Uh, this is Ghana, West Africa. Uh, well, I'm there in the back. You see everybody else got sick, but I was, by the grace of God, I was still going, doing good. The guy on the cell phone next to me to the right, he's a bus driver, uh, but all the rest of these guys are members of the church, and we planted this church right here. The guy standing up in the white shirt there to the left between the two ladies there, he's a school teacher, and in Ghana, West Africa, 
uh, school teachers or government employees like they are here, but they are assigned. You know, the government will tell you where to go to teach. And so he just arrived here to teach, and uh, he was a member of the church in another place. Uh, about a third of these people in this picture were driving, or not, not driving, taking public transportation or walking several miles, uh, like a long time journey to get to this place, to get to where they were, they lived in this community, but they had to go somewhere else to find a church assembled. And so uh, we thought it'd be a good time, a good and local brethren help us with these missions, where to go and what, what would be the most strategic locations and all that. So we planted the church here. So about a third of these people in that picture are local. And then some of them we studied with and later became Christians. And so now they're local. And so the church is planted there. The guy in the far right in the yellow uh, pattern shirt there with the blue long sleeves underneath it. Uh, he was a faithful co-worker from another place, but he, he's about my age. I think I'm about a few months older than him. I was born in July. He was born in September, and uh, he uh, suddenly passed away about two years ago. A great loss to the church there, but uh, you'll get to do foreign mission works. We do local campaigning as well, and so that's how we get the word out uh, in teaching. All right, then finally, the word of God must be continued. The word of God must be continued. Uh, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up, heap up for themselves teachers. Now, Jackie Steersman, one of my teachers, uh, when I, I came to school in 1989, B.C. Carr was still directing, and then in 91 I graduated and then went from there to Freed Hardeman, and then in 92, Jackie Steersman became the director. And then in 2009, I became the director. And we've only had three directors in that, that over 50 years of time. Uh, but Jackie Steersman used to have this, he would, he would say, don't ever say the Church of Christ teaches this or the Church of Christ teaches that. Because you can find a Church of Christ somewhere that teaches almost anything. But rather, you should say the Bible teaches this or the Bible teaches that and back up what we're teaching by Scripture. Because, again, there are those even in buildings that have church Christ on the outside that do not endure sound doctrine. Uh, and so we have to always be mindful of what is being taught. Because, again, only the Scriptures can make us wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so uh, we, people will not value truth. And a long time ago, I learned this lesson from my father-in-law. Now, Josh and I have been married 12 years. My first wife passed away in 2010, and we were married in 2012, and we just celebrated 12 years. Hey, how about that? Oh, yeah, we got married on the 16th, so it's not that whatever anniversary. It's, you know, 16 years will be our whatever the anniversary that is. Yeah. Anyway, but, uh, but it's good. But again, God is so good. Man, that's a whole other lesson, but I'll save that for another time. All right, but anyway. Um, but people will not always value the truth, and so we must uh, can make sure that the doctrine's being taught. And then, uh, but yeah, my father-in-law a long time ago told me when I first went to preaching school, there was this incident where, with marriage, divorce, and remarriage where they didn't know that this was back in the 80s, okay, where they didn't know that this couple was unscripturally married, and uh, they baptized the lady first, and then they were studying with the man, and then that's when they found all this out. And so they were real... Uh, you know, they were real patient, long-suffering in doctrine, trying to teach this. And after about a year of teaching, they finally had to disfellowship uh, that couple. But they just went down the road and found a congregation that just took them in, no, no problem and all of that. And that's, that's an issue. Now, of course, that was way back in the 80s when, uh, you know, maybe that wasn't as common maybe back then as it is now. But from that, I always learn when I'm studying with people to, to find out, you know, where they are in that way and, and the best way to do it I found is to look at Romans 7 when you're studying the difference between the covenants you know as long as a, uh, long as a, a husband is bound or wife is bound to the husband as long as he lives but if the husband is dead she is free to be married to another but if she's married to, to the one while the other is alive she's called an adulteress and of course Paul uses all that to illustrate that the law of Moses is dead it was nailed to the cross you're free to be married to Christ now and so uh, that, that's a good way to introduce that. I'll have some more to say about marriage uh, later on in this meeting. 
but that's a big issue uh, nowadays, uh, the marriage and divorce situation. Actually, it's not the marriage and divorce so much, but the divorce and the remarriage. That's where the, the problem comes in. All right, but we'll have more to say about that later on in the week. But notice, Timothy is told to be watchful, to endure, to fulfill your ministry. Now, we do have continuing education. We have our lectureship. It's always the third Monday. It starts the third Monday in January, uh, which is now they made, that Mar they made that a holiday, Martin Luther King Day, and our lectureship was going on long before that. But that's a good way to remember. So Martin Luther King Day is the first day of our lectureship uh, every year. And we have a sp specific theme. This year's the subject is going to be on heaven. Oh, yeah, you see Bruce Doherty up there. I don't know if you know him up there in the far right corner. Emmanuel's right below him and his son Vince right there. So there's three generations of Dohertys right there on that top right column as you look down. But they're, they got Ohio roots like crazy and West Virginia roots, all right? We also have our harvester, and I meant to bring that to, to, for people to sign, but we have a display table. If you'd like to get that electronically through the email, or we still mail it to you, we'll still mail it to you a paper copy as well. Uh, we'll have a sign-up sheet. Let me know. We can send that to you. That gives a teaching article, gives a little updates about the school, so you can keep up with the school if you'd like, but there's always the teaching articles in there. All right, and then we have extension classes where... Uh, this is in Apopka, which is north of Orlando. It's on the other side of the tracks, people might say. But one of these men is an elder. Four of these guys work during the day full time, but preach on Sundays. And these classes are especially designed for them. They can't come to day classes, not even online. But we do have night classes where they can learn the Bible, get strengthened. And so uh, we've been doing that for several years. And we have them in, in Jacksonville. We've had them in Gainesville. This one's in the Orlando area. Uh, Auburndale, and, and we've had them in Lakeland as well. And so these are ways that continue to teach the Word of God and to um, get brethren in. The dress code's a little bit different here at these night classes. The one guy's wearing a T-shirt. We don't allow that during the day classes unless it says FSOP on it. We'll allow that. Oh, you don't even do it. we don't even allow that anymore. Okay, good, yeah. The girls, man, they crack down on that stuff, the ladies. <laughs> anyway, all right, but we do that. Now, ways you can help real quick. Uh, become familiar <clears throat> with what we're all about at the Florida School of Preaching. Uh, pray for us. Pray for us to have students, to have support, uh, to have, you know, the things that we need to teach. Uh, there are three things that are needed for a school. Students, number one, staff to teach, and then also um, funds to work with. All right, that's just the bottom line of it. Uh, financially contribute to the Florida School of Preaching. Uh, we have individuals do this, congregations do this. And uh, we often ask congregationally if just $100 a month, if that's, that's it. Uh, that, that goes a long way, and most congregations could afford that much. But, again, we want you to be familiar with your work, to know what you're supporting. Uh, I'm available. We're available to speak and talk. We have all kinds of stuff, lectureship books, the Harvester, the monthly publication, to know what we teach. Uh, sometimes people accuse us of teaching this or that, but we, we can say, well, we don't. Well, sometimes we do, and it's truth. That's why we teach it. But uh, you, there's, there's no doubt what we teach, what we stand for. We have it in writing through all these publications and things. And so we have that. Also, you can help us to find students and supporters. Uh, we're always looking for students. It's a never-ending thing. And, um, you know, my, my biggest fear is we'll have a semester where there's no students to teach. Well, we've never had that. The Lord has always provided. But the Lord does provide through his church sometimes. And so... If you are a young man, and when I say young, that's relative, um, probably the oldest. Well, we've had a lot of guys that retired and came to school just because they wanted to be a better elder, a better Bible class teacher, to know more about the Bible. And uh, so all kinds of things. And then include us in your wills and estates. And uh, if there's any other questions you have about the school, just let me know. I'll be here all week. We've got a nice fellowship meal afterwards. I'd be happy to talk to you. All right, but I appreciate your, your listening to us this morning.